Here is my extra credit presentation on Cat's Cradle by Kurt Vonnegut. All right, so before I get started, I thought it was important to mention I went to three different libraries, Madonna, Milford, and Livonia, and I put it on the book on hold at all three libraries. And then when I got there, they couldn't find the book at all three locations. So it took me a long time to figure out how to read this book. And finally, um, I just decided to listen to the audiobook because I couldn't find a hard copy. And all of the, the libraries kept saying, uh, oh, we've got it, you know, we'll, we'll find it, we'll get it to you, we'll call you tomorrow, and no one ever found it. So um, I did listen to the audiobook. So this presentation uh, may not get any credit, but I thought I would do it anyway since I did listen to the audiobook. Um, I've included a link to the ver one of the versions of the audiobook that's just on YouTube, but I did um, use an app as well. So because I didn't actually read this book, like physically read the book, I um, had to kind of change up my approach. Instead of doing annotations and quoting and writing an actual summary on the text, I thought a presentation that summarized the main topics than what they made me think of. Maybe we'd get 50% or something on this assignment. Um, so in summary, the main topics talked about were humanity, religion, and the power of science, which was specifically um, explained through the Hiroshima bombing and everything in the aftermath. And the book is science fiction and comedic, uh, even though in the very beginning it says that nothing in the book is true, at least at first the text is very believable, and then after they go into a little bit more of their adventures, it's obviously fiction, but the parallels are still eerie. And um, I really liked the use of comedy in this book, and especially irony, to bring light to a depressing and universal topic. I also had no idea what a cat's cradle was before I started, so I thought it was, you know, maybe important to include the actual definition because I had no idea. Um, it's one of the oldest games in recorded human history, the first reference being in 1768, and variations of the game exist across many cultures worldwide, so there's no knowledge of where the game originated. And it's basically just making designs with strings in your hand. Um, make X's and kind of manipulate the X's to form other shapes. Um, the title kind of is almost cynical. It's There is one quote that I was able to pin, which is the emptiness of these X's, no damn cat, no damn cradle. Um, also, since it's such a simple game and the topics in this text are so complicated, so um, just developed and interesting, and um, I thought that The Cat's Cradle being one of the oldest and simplest games was a very interesting choice of title, because ultimately what this book comes down to is human stupidity and um, greed and all of the negative traits of humanity, really, and how maybe they've existed since the very beginning, just like this old and simple game. I did want to include a couple really quick slides summarizing the text or the audio. Um, Felix, who is one of the, maybe not necessarily the main character, but he's one of the main topics. And he was one of the creators of the atomic bomb, but he also really liked working with turtles. So the idea is, um, is he evil because he helped create this atomic bomb that killed so many people or, you know, or not because his intentions weren't to kill, well, his intentions weren't to personally kill a bunch of people. Um, that begs the question, are the creators of the bombs evil or were their intentions in the creation malicious or purely ap academic? Should that make a difference? Um, because either way, their creation resulted in the deaths of so many people. Felix was also the creator of Ice-9, which is another more powerful way to destroy the world. It was basically an isotope capable of freezing all of the liquid water on Earth. And eventually the children gave away the isotope in order to basically get whatever they wanted. Um, their greed and stupidity shines through this example. They didn't care about the consequences. They only wanted what they could gain from this isotope. They didn't care that it would ultimately lead to the end of the world. And um, their practices spread the substance 
that would eventually lead to the end of the world. So other than the summary, I thought that since I did listen to the audio version, it might be interesting to include a little bit more about what this made me think of, um, the book made me think of, and also just a summary of the, what I thought were the main themes. So on religion, John or Jonah is kind of like a prophet. He converts from Christianity to Bacchanism, which is a fictional religion. It's obviously fictional. It's based on lies. It's, um, it's kind of the idea of religion as a religion. And John or Jonah becomes a, prof a politician and head of this and really involved in this religion, which is, as I mentioned, founded on lies. And um, it kind of brings the question, are all religions founded on lies? Is religion a lie in general? Or one um, phrase I remember being mentioned was bittersweet lies, which is, what's the purpose of religion? Is it useful even though it's, even if it's all lies? Or is it an outdated political tool? Um, ultimately, I think this book kind of was saying that, yeah, religion, even though it, it may be all lies, it may be all fake, it's still beneficial. It still brings people together. And um, it still keeps people sane in some instances. On science, this book kind of summarized the old debate of knowledge is power or ignorance is bliss, which is preferred. Um, a lot of the time people would say knowledge, knowledge is power, but in this case, knowledge and power really led to the death of so many people. Um, specifically, Hiroshima was an event that changed earth and the progress of humanity, um, not just in this textbook, or in this text, but in reality. Um, Albert Einstein was one of the, he didn't actually create the atomic bomb, but his research is what made it possible for the bomb to be created. And he was a pacifist. He was um, really against the use of the bombs. And he, although he originally supported the research, he began to think of the future problems that bombs could bring. And one quote that I was able to find was, I've always condemned the use of the atomic bomb against Japan. And that's from Albert Einstein, one of the creators. So even Albert Einstein, one of the most famous minds in modern history or in history in general is maybe in this instant, the ignorance is bliss approach would have been more beneficial for humanity. Or maybe not, because we don't know what would have happened if Russia would have gotten involved or if Japan would have continued attacking the United States. It's something you can't really answer, but ultimately the bombings of Nagasaki and Hiroshima were um, detrimental and that can't be argued. So what were some of the connections that I was thinking of? Because I listened to this book while I was driving a lot, so my mind a little bit started to wander. Um, the main question I thought the science in this book brought was that the question, are we really moving forward as our scientific ability grows, or are we the same beings we were 200,000 years ago? Um, even though our collective consciousness, our collective knowledge base is improving, are we really becoming smarter or more evolved as a species? That made me think of the Fermi paradox specifically, which was created by Enrico Fermi, the, and it's the paradox that there's a high probability for the existence of life on other planets, but we lack evidence. We should, at this time, already know about life on other planets, life in our galaxy, outside of our galaxy, everything like that. Um, another statistic is if science grows at the rate of 3% per year, in a few million years, we could colonize an entire galaxy. And we're so young compared to the rest of the universe, so why hasn't anyone already done this? Why hasn't anyone already colonized another galaxy? And there's a few answers. Oh, there's a bunch of answers to the Fermi paradox, but some that reminded me of this textbook were, one, a simulated universe, which is that humans are likely to go extinct before we become post-human and create simulated realities, but we could also be in one. Um, that's the idea that the human race will go extinct before they reach a point where they're truly capable of colonizing a galaxy, whether it be by atomic bombs or plague or just um, lack of motivation, anything or just a natural disaster, anything could lead to the death of an entire species. Um, the second answer would be the youngness paradox, which was created by Alan Guth. 
and its eternal inflation and its implications. So it, even assuming an infinite number of universes, it's likely that each universe only has one advanced civilization, which means that we could really be the only civilization in our universe. And that's why we haven't contacted anyone or been contacted by anyone. Um, one quote, I think it was Neil deGrasse Tyson. It's, um, or maybe, maybe not. But um, one of the quotes that I really liked is, either we're alone in the universe or we're not, both are equally terrifying. And maybe that was Sagan on second thought. But anyway, the last response I thought was important to the Fermi paradox is that civilizations never reach the point where they can communicate because they destroy themselves in the process, which is basically no saying no civilization has ever overcome the issues associated with humanity. So like in the textbook, like in Cat's Cradle, these civilizations killed each other or killed themselves because of greed, because of um, money, because of a bunch of different reasons, but mainly just power and war. But either way, they led to the death of their civilization and the need for a religion because they were ultimately destroying themselves, which is an answer to the Fermi paradox saying every civilization destroys itself before they can reach the point where they can communicate with other planets. Some art connections that this specifically brought to mind. The first, both are Kubrick films actually, the first being Dr. Strangelove. Um, the book's obviously more comedic, but Dr. Strangelove does have some comedy in it as well. And that really tied in the connection of human stupidity when it comes to peace and evolution. Um, Dr. Strangelove is uh, also called um, what is it, Dr. Strangelove, or How I Learned to Love the Bomb? Oh, shoot, I forgot the exact title. But um, it's basically just the idea of nuclear war in Cold War era, and just basically human stupidity and how one single bomb could kill us all. Uh, it's not strategic at that point. It's just devastating. The second Kubrick film would be 2001, A Space Odyssey, which is that we've clearly not reached the next monolith, and we may never. The film 2001 A Space Odyssey is um, basically goes through the idea of human evolution from a previous form to our modern form and how we have not yet reached the next form. So in the most basic sense, we were monkeys, now we're humans, and then we're going to reach the next form, or we may, may or may not reach the next form, which would be some sort of abiological form, um, which brings back to that simulated universe response to the Fermi paradox. And the book really reminded me a lot of 2001 because it, to me, it was all about human evolution and how stupidity has really, um, it's really the catalyst for all major issues that would destroy the human race, such as war, corruption from power, um, and even to an extent religion. But um, I think the book had a more positive in, in interpretation of religion, but either way, um, both of them were saying that human stupidity could prevent us from reaching the next stage of evolution. And um, especially my interpretation of 2001, which has been open to interpretation, there's no clear meaning, um, but my interpretation was always that the next stage was a more peaceful stage in evolution, and that's why at the end of the film, um, all of the nuclear weapons and satellites around Earth were destroyed. And this book kind of made me think of what would happen just um, if all of our greed and evil intentions and all of the science that really can go be used positively or negatively, all of the potential implications, one of which is that we reach this next stage of evolution, the other of which is we destroy ourselves. Finally, some other literary connections. I drew a lot of parallels between this book and George Orwell's Animal Farm, as well as Pat Frank's Alas Babylon. Um, Alas Babylon, the connections were more clear. It's about a nuclear holocaust in the United States and then th the survival afterwards. Um, Orwell's Animal Farm, it just really, it's really the human stupidity, the innate need for power and the associated moral corruption. Um, Jonah or John really becomes a powerful figure, political figure, and then author, and 
he doesn't seem to be too corrupt and he understands everything, but he's more of a, um, he's an enlightened narrator, so to speak. So he, um, I don't think he was meant to represent the issues associated with humanity. It was more of, he was just there to tell the story of human stupidity in an interesting way through the stories of Felix, the children, Ice Nine, and everything else in this book. So here are my additional references. Again, um, I wasn't sure how to approach this since I didn't actually read the book. I listened to it. If I get zero points, I understand. If I get five points, I understand. But I thought I would submit it anyway. So um, hopefully this presentation made some sense and the approach made some sense as well. Either way, I liked the book.